Welcome to our sneak peek program for Woven, to uh, Woven Together Art and Arachnids. This exhibit is a community exhibit inspired by an episode of our educational video series, Bison Cast, which is playing on the wall over here, specifically the episode Beyond Beauty, which is about spiders. Um, featured in the video is Picasso's print La Ranier, which is featured in the Green Pathways Gallery in the museum. So if you go through the main galleries heading towards Unnatural Selections, Picasso's spider print along with 15 of his other prints are hanging on the wall and that's featured in the video as well, but it's worth it to see it in person. Um, in addition to Bison Cast, the room is filled with spiders made by local K-12 students on all of the giant webs you see on the wall and on this wall over here hanging from the ceiling. Um, in addition, we have nine professional regional artists represented on this back wall over here from Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. So again, my name is Sari Ann Platt and I am the Associate Curator, Curator of Education and Outreach. This exhibit officially opens tomorrow and is up through October 17th. We typically offer these sneak peek programs the day before an exhibit officially opens to the public. We find that visitors enjoy the opportunity to see a little bit behind the scenes and get a chance to gain some insight from the experts before the exhibit goes completely open to the public. Uh, before we launch right into things, I want to say we are so grateful for our sponsor for this exhibit, which is the estate of Bertram C. Raines. Some of you might know or might have known Bert Raines, who is a very prominent ornithologist in the area. Um, so we're very grateful that he sponsored this exhibit. Our special guests today are Maggie Rabowin, a behavioral ecologist working in the Jackson area, and the guest star in this bison cast episode, along with several of our spider friends. Along with her, we have artists D.G. House, Jesse Cole, and Rachel E. Smith, who are featured on this back wall in the exhibit. They will be around after the exhibit to answer questions about their artworks if you have them. Uh, Maggie is going to be giving a talk today on spiders and giving some scientific background to go along with this exhibit. And our three artists, again, will be here at the conclusion of the program in case you have any questions. As always, following the sneak peek program, which will be about 30 minutes, give or take. Attendees are welcome to have lunch in our Palette Restaurant, which is open until 2 today. They offer 10% if you identify yourself as a Sneak Peek Program attendee. Um, and now it is my pleasure to pass things off to Maggie. Hi, thanks you guys for being here. Um, I guess, what do you, do you want me to talk about? Yeah, how did they start about how you each how you started working with our education group last awesome. summer? Yeah, and then yeah. go into talk about the mason spiders and maybe a little bit about the video spider. Oh yeah. Because so those two spiders are featured in the video. Awesome. And most people here have not had a chance yet to watch the video. Okay. So maybe I'll just say uh, yeah. something real quick about that. The video is part of our bison cast series, which is an educational series. We always start with a uh, some work from our permanent collection. In the case of this video, we were inspired by the Picasso spider that Sari mentioned earlier, called La Ragne, which just means the spider in French. And so we started inside with our educators talking about that piece, having a conversation about the art and the artist. And then we went outside, and there you see me with Maggie in this shot here. And we went over by the Snake River Bridge, south of town, where Maggie first discovered the mason spider. And she showed us, it was in July, so we saw lots of jumping spiders. And then later, we went back in August and filmed the mason spiders, because they were really just getting started building their mounds. So Maggie, if you could talk about what it was like working yeah. with us to create this video, and then also get into a little bit more about what is the mason spider, what is the jumping spider, because those are the ones we focus on in this video. Yeah, that, that sounds great. great. But thanks, <laughs> All right, so I, um, I guess I can say, um, I think it was in 2016, I first met Jane um, as a part of a, the Spiders Interconnectedness exhibit or program yeah. that um, happened here at the museum where I think there was a bunch of artists like DG who did uh, works on spider, inspired by spiders and then some, a handful of, of scientists that studied spiders and we kind of collaborated and communicated um, about those things. And then, 
Jane contacted me about doing the bison cast program, and I was so excited and thankful and um, ready to share all the research I've been doing and sort of knowledge about spiders in the area because there's so many amazing, beautiful spiders that are very small and they're everywhere in the environments around here, um, but most of the time people don't see them because they're so small and there's so much to see looking up that we don't spend a lot of time looking down. Um, and so what I wanted to do is focus on, most of my research focuses on the mason spider, which I'll tell you a little bit about, but also jumping spiders. And so those are the two that are featured in the, um, in the film. That's and this is the, mason. that's the mason spider working on her egg sac. Um, and so, yeah, in, I, I uh, found the mason spider, first started watching them, um, I think in 2010. I was an undergrad at the University of Montana studying wildlife biology and spent a lot of time down here um, actually looking for and collecting jumping spiders. And while I was doing that, I came across this spider that was scurrying all over the ground and collecting pebbles in their pedipalps and, and um, carrying them all over the place and, and little sticks and seeds and flower petals. Um, and then putting it, building them into a little mound on a rock. And I became so curious and was, was you know, I'd never heard of a spider doing this sort of behavior before and, and had no idea what they were doing. And so I, I raced back to Missoula to ask my professors, like, what, what is this spider doing? I've never seen anything like this before. And it turned out that nobody had. So I'm sure people had seen it before, but nobody had sort of asked the question. Um, and that became my PhD work at Berkeley. So um, yeah, we've discovered some things. So, <laughs> um, so the mason spiders, those are, they're all the females that are collecting items in the environment. They build these mounds on top of their egg sacs. And the mounds end up being incredibly protective of the egg sacs. So it protects them from these parasitoid wasps that wander around. And the wasps are wingless, so they just wander around and look for any, um, actually they cue into silk, and they look for anything that's covered in silk, and then they um, stick their ovipositor in there and parasitize the eggs. They lay their own eggs in there so they can eat the spider eggs. Um, but they would also do it if there was like a caterpillar in, the, in a silken sac. Um, and so the mound protects the egg sac from those wasps. And, so, and also, um, it seems to protect them in some way from like fluctuating temperatures, from the eggs getting really hot or getting really, really cold. But the um, amazing thing that we found is that the mason spiders, they spend almost, or probably over you know, 12 to 14 hours in the heat of the day constructing this mound. And they, con they conduct thousands and thousands of collecting trips in the environment, just scurrying all around, collecting things and bringing it back. Um, and they sort of like waste away doing this. So it, it requires a lot of energy. Um, and I guess for good reason, because it provides a lot of protection. <laughs> um, yeah, jumping spiders. Yeah, so jumping there's, spiders. there's also jumping spiders in this video. So this is, is uh, uh, called Habernatus um, altanus, that little spider. And then there's another species in here that has red, a really bright red face. And that's Habernatus americanus. And they're about five millimeters big, but you can find them all over. Um, and they're incredible because they, um, the males are really brightly colored like birds, and then the females are kind of drab and um, mottled brown and gray. But the males do these incredible, beautiful dances that they wave their legs, and then they also sing vibratory songs. So they vibrate their abdomens, and they have like a, instruments kind of on their bodies, so they rub them together and it sings a song that's transmitted through the ground to the female. And she picks up those vibrations in her legs, um, and then and the songs are sort of coordinated with their dances, and he tries to impress her um, in order to mate. And the females are incredibly choosy, so if they don't like the male's song and dance, they just will eat him, usually. Uh, <laughs> um, so they are, they are all over the place, and there's actually, um, in this genus, Habernatus, which has, all, everyone is, you know, there's many different species that all look very different, and they all have really different songs that they sing. I think in the area there's at least ten different species, so they come in colors like orange and blue and red and 
tufts of hair on their heads and knees that are like balloons that are orange that all of them are used in their dances to impress the females. Um, so you should keep your eyes open for those. You can find them on rocks usually if you just look around on the trails. They're everywhere. So Maggie, I have a question. Yeah. One of the things that Sari has tried to do with this exhibit is emphasize how spiders are woven together in the title, how they contribute to the ecosystem yeah. and how people can you know, affect each other, all of their actions, as well as affecting the wildlife around them. Could you yeah. talk about how spiders are good for the <coughs> ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, we talk a little bit about in the film too, spiders are incredibly important for the ecosystem. They do all sorts of sort of ecosystem services. They provide food, obviously, for a lot of animals, like birds. Um, I mentioned in the video, I've seen, uh, you know, grouse in my field sites, and sometimes when I'm filming the spiders, they'll snatch up the egg sacs or the spiders while they're building. Um, they do actually a lot of interesting things because um, they are artists and architects. They build things in the environment that end up um, being used by other animals. So sometimes their mounds or their webs, like oftentimes their silk and their webs will be used by birds to build their nests. Um, or they'll be used, like the mounds will often be used by other insects. They'll use them to hide or use the materials in them to build something else. So they're, they're called, oftentimes called ecosystem engineers because they change how the environment looks um, and how other, inter other animals interact with the environment. And then um, in terms of how like we are connected with spiders, we, uh, a lot of my research recently has been focused on vibrations. So I talk about um, how the jumping spiders communicate with vibratory songs. But actually, most spiders communicate that way, and they sense their environment through vibrations, and they communicate with each other, but also with other animals with vibrations. And so what I've been focusing a lot of my research on now is how humans have introduced vibrations into the environment and how that's impacting not only spiders, but actually 98% of animals actually sense vibrations through the ground rather than through the air like we do. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is sort of like a totally un- um, explored avenue of our connections with animal, a lot of animals. Um, and spiders are like the perfect animal to focus on. And is that yeah. your current research? Uh, yeah. Along the lines of like the vibratory? Yeah, exactly. Issues. Yeah, so a lot of my research now is looking at sort of trying to record and characterize the vibrations that humans are introducing into the landscape. Mm -hmm. and, look at, and they travel much further than sort of vibrations through the air and they can be much louder. And invertebrates like spiders and insects are very, very sensitive to vibrations. And so we're trying to figure out how these things are interacting. Um, and so one of the projects that I'm wrapping up now is looking at the mason spider and how vibrations from traffic in their, in it, where I find them, where they live, have influenced how they are building their mound. So um, they actually, um, you know, they're making these collecting trips, and when cars drive by, they stop, and then they, they get lost, they can't find their mound again, so they start circling and circling. Um, and so those spiders that are in areas with a lot of vibrations in the environment, they don't build their mounds as quickly or as efficiently, and likely has consequences for how well their eggs survive. Um, yeah. I think we could switch to questions. Yeah. Yeah. I have two questions. Uh, one, when you find the spider, do you get to name the spider? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we're working on, so this spider is um, right now, so it's in the genus Castanera, and um, it needs to be basically characterized by its morphological features and DNA, which takes a long time, and the genus is like sort of a mess. So, um, somebody is working on reorganizing the genus before naming it, but um, the, the proposed name is Castanera Tiwanaticus, um, because we wanted, I wanted a place name. Um, and it's bad form to name it after yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be the scientific name. That would be the but scientific name. But what about Mason Spider? Oh, Mason Spider, yeah. So I called it the Mason Spider because in the environment, there's a lot of mason bees that are the same. They do the same thing. So they're masons, you know, like 
like bricklayers, and they construct almost identical structures. And it's a whole group of bees that's pretty well known and pretty well studied. So as shorthand, I just started calling them mason spiders and um, head stuff. So my second question was about the vibration. Yeah. I'm wondering if we somehow lost the vibration of the Yeah. Is it the same kind of thing that you're looking at? That that's a, spiders do or? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, the it's hard to know because I think our sensory organs, I think all, can be capable of picking up vibrations from the ground and from structures if we are sort of like focused on that or don't have the ability to hear through the ear our ears, which you know sort of overtakes all those other senses. But spiders have special organs that are just for picking up vibrations from the ground. And they're in their legs, they're called liriform organs. So they're kind of in their joints. And when the vibrations come, they're really sensitive. They have hairs in them, um, similar to our ears, but they're specifically for picking up vibrations. And actually most invertebrates, like insects and spiders, have those type of organs. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah, good questions. Other questions for Maggie? Yeah. Do our does our Wi-Fi system <coughs> affect them? Uh, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> the magnetic stuff that we surround ourselves. So that is, I think that is like a very up and coming um, research question that a lot of people are going to be focusing on because many animals and invertebrates in particular are very sensitive to electromagnetic things um, in a much different way than we are, obviously. And so I think people are starting to ask those questions, but. So much is unknown. <laughs> Prior to you know the nest building, do mason spiders hunt like a like a funnel spider? Are oh, they, good question. Yeah. yeah. How do they do? So they're they do? wandering spiders. Both mason spiders and jumping spiders are wandering spiders, which means that they don't build nests or burrows. They or don't build webs or burrows. They're just like um, like the crab spider. They're mm -hmm. just ambush predators. So they um, just pounce, just <laughs> pounce whatever. <laughs> so they find. Um, and the, the jumping spiders are fun to watch when they're hunting because they're, they're super cat-like and they sort of like hum, hunker down and then pounce just like a cat would, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah? How far can the jumping spider go? A long ways. <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. I think we've done some jumping studies in our lab, and I'm not sure the actual distance, but it would be something like, I mean, half a meter Okay. At times, like you know, and they're five millimeters. So. Right. Okay. And they use um, they use like pressurize. They pressurize their limbs, so that's part of the hunkering down. It, they don't have muscles like like mammals do, so they sort of pressurize their limbs and then shoot. Shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are uh, mason spiders found all over Wyoming, or does anyone know? We don't know. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, out west, they, like in the entire western US, there are a handful of spiders that are very closely related to mason spiders. Um, but they sort of live in deserty areas and they don't build mounds. Out here, I haven't done, you know, I, I only know where I've hiked and if I've seen them. And I've found them sort of like, you know, like the almost to the top of Jackson Peak or um, Sleeping Indian or uh, yeah, so like 10,000 feet, and then we find them a lot of times along the Snake River, so they're they're everywhere. And I saw them so, in the Wind River Range. Yeah, yeah, summer. you did, yeah. So are they pretty common? Yeah, they're pretty common when you find them. Um, the, the easiest way to see them is to find their egg sacs, because they're sort of like pearly, um, shiny. And if you look in the crooks in rocks, like bigger rocks that are on the ground, you'll oftentimes see them. But the mason spiders are hard to find because they are, you will only see them when they're building the mound. So we almost never see the males because they're not building the mounds. And the females only build them basically from the middle of July until the middle of August. So it's like one month, and that's kind of the only time you can see them. So when I first saw them, I just got lucky, you know, perfect, right place, right time. So after your initial sighting of a mason spider, how long did it take you to find one again? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I think the next year I went back 
and did you look in the same spot same spot yeah. same time of yeah. year um, but you know when early on in my in my graduate research I would go the beginning of June or like the end of May which is when you know jumping spiders are really coming out a lot of other spiders are out um, and I wouldn't find I just spent every day I would go out every day all night sometimes because I'm like are they out at night I don't know why I can't find them and then it was like July 12th every year, you know, July 12th, July 14th, and then I would see them. But it's, you know, you would think they'd be out. I just don't know where they are. <laughs> I think they're under rocks and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's their lifespan? I think they only live a year, which is, which is um, a lot like most spiders and insects. But I, I've done some work looking at their overwintering. So they overwinter in the egg sacs as little spiderlings. So they stay in there and kind of hunker together and they stay, um, the mound washes away when it rains. So the mound only sticks around for like a week. And then when it rains, it washes away. I mean, this year it might be a month or so <laughs> before it rains. Um, but then they stay under the, under the snow in that egg sac. And then in like April, they emerge out of the egg sac. Kind of crazy that they. I think so. We did at um, in the lab. We did some work looking at how cold, how much cold they can withstand, and they could withstand up to 16 degrees below zero before freezing. So, um, like a lot of insects and spiders, you know, they have special sort of molecules in their blood so that they can withstand really. So I, I want to have one more question, okay. and it has to do with the art sides in interactions, oh which you've been led yeah. into by myself and other people here. Yeah. So we do have three artists here, DG House, if you could raise your hand, who created this piece over here, and Jesse Colera, who created this piece right here, and then we have Rachel Smith, who created uh, the... What kind of spider? Goldenrod crab spider. Goldenrod yeah. crab spider. So my question is, for the artist and for the scientist, how has knowledge of each other's work helped you in creating your artwork? And I'm also gonna gonna bring Shannon Borrego into this if she's still here. Is she she's still here? No, she might have taken she's off. With her she was with the she was the art teacher who worked with the high school students on the pieces over here. But yeah, if you could, any of you, speak to yeah. that intersection between art and science, what you each have to offer each other, and what you can do together that maybe you couldn't do by yourselves. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I wouldn't have painted a spider if I hadn't been asked to. <laughs> <laughs> um, art and science go hand in hand in so many ways that it's yeah. pretty fascinating, really. So this was a lot of fun. I don't have a lot to say about it, but <laughs> I will say it's important, and it's great that we've done it. Yeah, authentic art is based on real experience, right? You can tell when somebody paints a bear that knows a bear, as compared to someone that's seen a picture of a bear. So I met Maggie in the beginning of this for her, in, in 16, yeah. Yeah. and she was in the paper, and <laughs> I, I just adored her immediately for her, not only her enthusiasm and her intelligence, but her ability to go out every single day, night and day, and devoted herself. You know, my question for her is how her life changed after uh, her direction of her life changed after this. But we got to be in a casual setting and eat together, a whole group of us, yeah. uh, scientists, scientists that were working on, do you remember this? Catheters made out of silk and, yeah. and all, just all kinds of stuff, and then, and, and me, <laughs> um, we're all together. I was listening to all these people. We went out to eat together, and be your real life then became my connection. Yeah. And I look down now because of you, but really it was because of um, Sarah out from Harvard, yeah. um, and then your personal experience where I live. <laughs> so really, um, for me, my art is inspired by your life and oh, your research. <laughs> Yeah, I, so I, this goes, I mean, I don't know, 
I could say so many things, but <laughs> the, the working with the artists especially is um, incredibly important, I think, for scientists um, and has been incredibly important for me because it helps us, or helps me, I'll just speak for myself, look at sort of the animals we're working with or the environment in such a different way, which is incredibly important for conducting um, good science, asking good questions, interesting questions, or like questions you would never ask before. Um, and so, you know, the artist always brings sort of a different perspective or a different way of looking at something. And oftentimes that can bring me to asking a question or, that I would have never asked before. And, you know, I talked a lot about the vibrations. And that's something, um, that sort of line of inquiry um, has taken a long time sort of to get attention and for scientists mm -hmm. to ask because of the way that we perceive the world, you know, which is not through vibrations. So we're incredibly limited, and I think artists oftentimes open up um, our eyes and other sensory experiences to other other ways of seeing the world, and that's, you know, one of them is through, is now I see the world like it's changed my, my personal life and my perspective into seeing the world um, much differently and thinking more about vibrations. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's yeah, yeah. One way, that's I guess, great. which is yeah, super important. And I think another thing, just looking at the work that these artists have created, is you know there are quite. A, let's admit it, there are a lot of people who are not yeah. attracted to spiders. Yeah. But <laughs> all of these pieces are beautiful and will draw you in and get you curious about you know what's going on with these flowers here. That's such a beautiful spider, and the flowers speak to the habitat and the hiding of the spider, like Rachel's with the spider hiding in the flower. And, but then, you know, you draw back and you realize it is a spider, but hopefully it makes you, it's a, it's a way to, to think about them differently. And people who have this aversion maybe won't be, have that aversion, and they'll learn more, and then that will expand out into the world, hopefully. I can maybe add in lieu of Shannon being here, um, part of my job at the museum is I create and implement pretty much all the K through 12 programming with Jane's help, of course. And so the 300 plus student spiders you see on the wall, um, I created with them either going to their classrooms or bringing them here. And a lot of those children were afraid of spiders. Before we started the craft, they said, I don't want to make a spider, I want to make something else. This isn't fun, it's creepy. And I was like, let's just, let's just try it. Let me, <laughs> let me show you an example. Let's watch this video. I promise the jumping spider with its big eyes is really cute. And most of them at the end would watch the video and be like, okay, I, I do want to make a spider. I'm excited to make my spider. And Maggie did not get to name the mason spider after herself, but there are two spiders in this exhibit. This pink one to the right on this web over here, and this one with the giant pink pom-pom abdomen. Uh, two of the girls at Jackson Hole Children's Museum were so inspired by seeing women scientists that they named their spiders the Maggie spider. So, <laughs> so art and science can really reshape a kid's life even in the span of a hour-long program, which is why we view educational exhibits like this to be so important. Any final yeah, any comments, other questions? questions? Okay, I can wrap it up. So, um, as a reminder to you all, as a thank you for joining us today. Um, Palette Restaurant does offer a special discount to Sneak Peek program attendees that is 10% off, and they are open to, until 2 today. Um, and we want to ask you all to come back on August 14th for a Spanish language talk with ecologist Jose Sanchez, who will be giving a talk about how everyone can be a citizen scientist. This is geared towards families and will be in Spanish. Um, you may notice in the exhibit there is two of every panel and two of every label. The exhibit is fully bilingual as well. Um, and the bison cast video will be updated with Spanish language subtitles, hopefully by the end of today. Um, but thank you all so much for coming and more details about upcoming events can be found on our website.